Um, welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Leon Feinstein, uh, Professor of Education and Children's Social Care in the Department of Education in Oxford. And I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's public seminar, um, which is a discussion about the definition of childhood in relation to, particularly in relation to the United Nations Convention and its application around the world in different contexts, but really stepping back from that and thinking about the history of notions of childhood in, in different contexts and at different times. Um, I, I just want to say very quickly by way of introduction that this is part of a series of seminars that have been designed by colleagues Minoli, Wiam and Nika, who you can see on the panel, um, who uh, took a course that I taught last year on the implementation of the rights of the child, which was really a course about policy and policy design. And uh, my colleagues felt that important issues about meaning, culture, diversity, power um, were, were not adequately represented on the course. And so we've designed a series to, to introduce uh, a, a wider body of ideas, thought and challenge um, and to share that with a wider audience, because I think uh, the, the, the role of, uh, of, of children uh, we see in pandemic, the difficulty of ensuring that children's rights really are constantly at the forefront and recognized, but there are very complex issues about how we define and understand these things. So we've um, convened this seminar and, and this seminar particularly led by uh, Manoli. Uh, huge thanks to Manoli and to our wonderful speakers. We've got a tremendous uh, distinguished and informed panel of speakers today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussion. Um, we're talking about the definition of childhood I should say uh, it, it's a webinar event, so colleagues not on the panel won't be able to be filmed, um, but please do ask questions as we go along. And uh, Catherine, who's chairing the debate, uh, will, will share questions and I hope we'll have a full discussion. Um, so it only remains for me to introduce Catherine, our chair today, Dr. Sloan, who is a social and cultural historian of 19th century Britain. Catherine, who is at Hartford College in Oxford, and her research focuses on the changes to education, youth and childhood in the 19th century, with a particular interest in, in, in young people's role in shifting those changes. Fascinating and important topic. Uh, and uh, Catherine, over to you. And thank you very much for chairing today. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Rees Centre, to our convener, Ian Feinstein, and also to the organisers, um, Nika Nazari, Wayam Hamden, and Minoli Wijatunga, who all invited us here today. I'm really, really grateful, and to the Social Sciences Division, who have helped us do the magical setup of all the tech. Um, so our first, our first our basic um, discussion today is around the topic of what is a child, um, and I just want to throw out some brief thoughts before I hang out, hand over to our first speaker. Um, the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child suggests a very simple or universal or kind of common sense definition of childhood as someone who's under 18. Um, and I think for everyone here today, um, this common sense definition is something which is perhaps a little bit more complicated. I think one of the things that we'll be doing today is challenging this common sense and the type of problematic assumptions that underlies it. Childhood, of course, is a category which can give us rights. It can give us special protections and special freedoms. But accepting the common sense of that is problematic. Not all people under 18, even in Britain, get that protection or freedom that we think of with childhood. Um, one of the cases we can see is the case of the schoolgirl, Shumaima Begum. Um, so the category of child becomes complicated when we consider who actually gets to be a child and how race, gender, class, and ability inform that decision, um, and how these things are often privileged over age. The second thing I think will be important today is that childhood is also a category which, for protective reasons, suspends rights. And accepting this as commonplace is also really problematic. I could take legal action against any adult who physically kicks or slaps me, um, but children today cannot act against parents who inflict corporal punishment. It is lawful if considered reasonable. Scotland accepted. This is because children aren't seen as fully adult or fully human. Um, and so it is seen as guidance um, to uh, inflict corporal punishment. So 
The category of childhood also exists as a category which can be invoked at disciplinary ends. And we've seen this with the British Empire over history, often invoking the category of childhood to institutionalize not just indigenous children, but entire indigenous populations. So I'm hoping today that kind of looking to history is going to illuminate childhood as something which may appear common sense to us, but is a category which is endlessly bound up in historical processes, including our own historical moment today and in its concurrent manifestation in the United Nations um, Convention. And hopefully we'll get some rich discussions of childhood and why it is that we, we treat younger humans as being somehow different from ourselves. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is Professor Sean Halcrow, who is a professor in bioarchaeology at the University of Otago, and she focuses on the place of infants and children in human populations over a very long durée. Um, I followed Sean's research online via Twitter with real fascination for a number of years now, so it really is such an enormous pleasure to welcome her to speak today. Um, welcome, Sean, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much. I was just um, thinking about the context of New Zealand and we've actually, um, we don't have corporal punishment towards children here anymore. So it's, it's it can change. Um, can, you, can you all see that? Great, thank you very much. Thank you to the, to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, when I considered the question of what is a child, I thought, goodness, I don't think I can actually answer this, is there's obviously so much historical variation in the conceptualization of childhood in the past. And pondering this further, I think it's imperative that we look not just at uh, age definition, as Marilyn and others will talk about today, the periodization of childhood is not uncontested, but to consider the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, acknowledgement of the central role of care and protection for the child from within the family and also by the state. Today I will discuss how we look at children in conceptualized childhood and bioarchaeology. And we do this through a biocultural approach. I want to showcase some new directions in the field that highlight a progression from simply looking for and including children to an investigation of their complex social and biological relationships with others and aspects of their care and health in the past. Before we start, I just wanted to quickly mention the University of Otago um, that Catherine talked about before. This is where I'm based, the oldest university in New Zealand and also the southernmost and closest university to Antarctica in the world. We have a strong biological anthropology research group here with several permanent academic staff as well as postdocs and research fellows. Um, and we've got a focus on understanding the evolution, migration and adaptation of people throughout Asia and the Pacific and New Zealand, um, applying a multitude of techniques from molecular anthropology to um, paleopathology. So the field of bioarchaeology most simply defined is the study of human remains from the archaeological context. Our work takes a biocultural perspective, as I said before, whereby we acknowledge human adaptation as being embedded um, within a rich social and cultural environment. We literally look at how the human skeleton can change in light of the environment by reading aspects of stress and disease from the actual physical remains of the body. And these health indicators are interpreted in the context again of um, the archeological um, remains and also sometimes if we've got them available, um, historical social evidence. So the main archeological or anthropological questions that I'm really interested in is looking at major uh, human changes or transitions in the past, whether that's epidemiological transitions or um, agricultural transitions and um, others, and the effects that that has on people in the past. 
Um, I look at this question in many different contexts, including East Asia. I do work in uh, China, uh, a lot of my works in, in Southeast Asia um, and also South America to assess the diversity of human adaptation to a range of different um, social, cultural um, environments. Within bioarchaeology, it's now widely acknowledged that because infants and children are very susceptible to environmental um, constraints and pressures, that they're one of the most um, sensitive, sensitive barometers of health and disease of a whole population. Some diseases that we see as well um, in the bones are primarily childhood conditions. For example, diseases related to vitamin C and D deficiencies are primarily primarily childhood conditions. A focus on the archaeology of children really emerged in most part following the push to find women in prehistory in the 70s and 80s um, and, and include them in interpretations as they weren't in the past. Important archaeological works began to emerge about 25 years ago um, including classic works from Crete Lillehammer um, in A Child is Born and also Catherine Kemp's work where she asks, where have all the children gone in archaeology? Um, Jane Eva Baxter um, has been instrumental in her approach to the investigation of childhood with a very sophisticated interrogation of aspects of material culture, um, social um, and cultural age and also aspects of gender and how they intersect within the archaeological record. Of course, we know that childhood is both a biological and a social phenomenon. With the development of theoretical approaches in the archaeology of children 25 years or so ago, um, it was recognized that because of the specialization in research fields within anthropology, children from the archaeological record were studied either from a biological perspective, that is bioarchaeology, or more predominantly from a social perspective in terms of social archaeology, with little research that incorporates both these approaches. And I've got here a quote from Catherine Camp. Um, that says most of the studies on childhood paleo health, so childhood bioarchaeology, are weakened because they fail to use archaeological data to establish age group boundaries. Studies usually start with a definition of groups that seems logical to the investigator, and in most um, situations, this is biological age groups. Um, studies, sorry, um, and then test for differences between the groups rather than beginning the exploration by looking for differences that might imply local age definitions or social age definitions. Because the burial remains, which are often the basis for research into children's health and nutrition, are one of the primary sources for establishing age groups archaeologically, this area of investigation should be one of the pioneers in such a process. <clears throat> um, this critique um, was important because it stimulated bioarchaeologists to think more about childhood age, both from a biological sense and also a social sense, and of course the intersections between the two. Since this time, there's been a number of attempts to address this issue, including Joanna Sophia's work in the body's material culture. In line with sociological theory, she uses the concept of the body as a hybrid the notion of the body being socially and biologically unfinished and therefore a cumulative formulation of a complex entity that develops over time. Here the body is viewed as both a material and a cultural object. With this approach, we move from um, beyond the, a simple bioarchaeological model whereby bony changes are seen as purely in an adaptation to the environment and therefore um, we move beyond the nature cultural dualism to an analysis of the total environment, social cultural environment in which people are situated in the objects in which they interact causing changes to the material body. 
Similar to archaeology, the bioarchaeology of childhood is a rapidly growing field. However, even though health and well-being of children is the main focus of our work, um, and uh, health and well-being of children is utterly dependent on social aspects of their care, there has been very limited investigation of care of children in the past. The UNCRC um, acknowledges the primary role of parents and families in the care and protection of children, and also the state's role to help families care for children. The MOMO review into health inequalities in England proposes a strategy to address the social determinants of health, um, which are the social conditions in which people are born, grow, live, and age within which can lead to these health inequalities. Um, as, as quoted, um, the foundations for almost all aspects of human development, physically, intellectually, and emotionally, are laid in early childhood. And we can probably extend this argument to include care for the pregnant person before the birth of the baby. Therefore, care during the start of one's life is essential to health. There is a developing interest in bioarchaeology of pregnancy and also the maternal infant nexus with the recognition of the importance of the developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis. I would argue that fetal and maternal health is the most critical um, time for mother and baby during pregnancy. Given the increased energy requirements of pregnancy and also the growth requirements during this time of, of babies in utero. Pregnancy can have negative effects on the health of, of women and the baby already compromised by malnutrition and disease. And it can also increase the susceptibility of mother and baby to new diseases. And our work has shown the intricate link between the pregnant body and the baby with evidence for maternal um, transmission of things like vitamin deficiencies, um, within particularly harsh environmental constraints and instances of in utero growth retardation with unfavorable maternal health with infectious disease in past populations. In addition to um, thinking about the care of the pregnant parent, it is important to consider postnatal care from a biocultural and also an evolutionary perspective. Care is obviously social and it's culturally mediated. And um, it's obviously also a central experience of all human beings. Um, in addition, because humans have increased encephalization, so we've got bigger, bigger brains, bigger heads, um, infants are born in a very immature state compared with non-human primates, so they require significant care. Human neonates are born with the least developed brains of any primate, um, with less than 30% of um, the adult size. Early life, as you know, is also a very critical time in terms of a person's um, growth, um, in terms of the physical growth and also immune system development and as an essential window for learning and socialization. We've recently presented um, for bioarchaeology a holistic model of the conceptualization of the social and environmental determinants of care and therefore health for mother and babies. This model considers the reconstruction of care in the context of several facets, including um, how we consider um, social age, so what we consider as an infant and a child, aspects of social inequality within populations, um, social aspects of identity, including, um, as I said before, age and gender, aspects of community support for parents, um, if, if a society has got allo parenting, infant feeding factors, maternal health, family and social structure, and also environmental factors such as pathogen loads. A direct way to look at maternal care and health and uh, also the conceptualization of personhood and, and childhood at the start of life in the bioarchaeological record is through looking at very young babies. 
there's very little work that's actually directed towards looking at the unborn or the youngest in society in bioarchaeology. And it's actually quite rare to find babies in utero in the archaeological record. Bone development doesn't actually start until approximately six um, to eight weeks gestation and bone formation prior to the second trimester is very unlikely to be preserved. Mortuary treatment of the very young is important to provide information on aspects of personhood and age in the community. In the past, literatures tended to assume that infants weren't grieved for in many past contexts, um, with high infant mortality, for example. However, recent work in archaeology um, and beyond is really challenging these assumptions of the marginalization of the very young in archaeology um, and that they weren't considered um, people, for example. I want to close with some recent work that's revealed the youngest prenatal individual ever found archaeologically. Um, and you'll see here, um, this picture here, you've got the scales as millimetres. So these are the osseous or the bony remains of this tiny baby. Um, a concealed um, internment of a preterm nine week old gestational age baby. So this here is part of the mandible from different aspects. And these are the ribs and the scapula um, and long bones as well. I think this is a humerus and this is probably a femur. Um, so um, this baby was con uh, concealed in tumor, as I said, uh, placed in a container in the wall of a parish church in southern Sweden um, in, in the uh, 19th century. Under the late 18th and 19th century Swedish law, a fetus wasn't recognized as an individual. That is um, a person with, with, you know, they didn't have their own rights. But um, despite this baby's very young age and this legislation, the authors argue that this burial, um, or this, this fetus, this individual, was considered a person with hoped for future and upon death, a person with a potential role in the afterlife and therefore entitled to funerary treatment and burial within that sacred ground. To conclude, recent work in bioarchaeology is really highlighting this intricate nexus or connection between the pregnant body and the, the infant body and the critical importance of early life care. It could be argued, therefore, um, that it's a, such an important foundation of one person's life is laid down in utero, then maternal care and, and the health of a mother should really take central place for the conceptualization of the start of childhood and childhood care. Although I haven't had a chance to touch on it today, there are many other interesting developments in the field of bioarchaeology, including things like determining the time of puberty um, and ad adolescence and so forth. Um, which is highlighting, for example, the effects that ill health can have on that process with evidence, for example, for de delayed menarche during times of epidemics and so forth. Um, those new methods combined with mortuary artifact analysis across the life course could therefore investigate the conceptualization of the end of childhood and the start of reproductive age in past societies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, and I think it's actually really fascinating to see anything on the very young, because as a historian of childhood, and I know this is something Professor Stearns has mentioned in his own work, that early childhood is one of the most difficult to theorise, to access as historians. Um, so thank you very much. I'm sure we get loads of rich discussion about biology, care, and um, sort of histories of childhood from that. Our second speaker is Professor Peter Stearns, who is a professor of history and art history at George Mason University, which is really interesting because one of the reasons as historians we're here is actually because of the art history um, of Arias, who wrote his Centuries of Childhood. Um, Peter Stearns focuses on world history, including his monograph on childhood in world history and many articles in all the kind of historical journals, such as the Society the history of childhood and youth. Um, welcome, Professor Stearns, and if you want to take your turn. Thank you so very much. So I want to focus on the 
probably the most familiar of the three topics today. I want to focus on the emergence of a clearer definition of childhood in Western society on both sides of the Atlantic from basically the late 18th to the, through the early decades of the 20th century. This was a prolonged period of redefinition and we'll talk a little bit about why it took so long. Um, the, trans the transition was not completed in the early 20th century, but I'm talking about roughly a century and a half of really substantial change. Um, the process has been studied by a number of historians of childhood as, as Professor Sloan has indicated, but I think probably it's true that the, the findings have not entirely been put together and um, what I'm doing is combining some stuff that probably needs, the, the, the combination of which probably needs further analysis and thought. Okay, we begin with the statement that before the later 18th century, many familiar aspects of childhood were not very well defined and many children were involved uh, frequently in activities and situations that today we would regard as largely adult. Three categories of example. Marriage is one. Uh, Roman law established that marriage age was 12. Uh, most European societies maintained that definition into the later 18th century, although many children in fact got married earlier. Uh, the situation was not uh, systematically regulated. Um, and obviously by our standards, 12 is pretty young. Second, military service. Uh, a number of soldiers in the, on the American side in the Revolutionary War in the 18th century were nine years of age. Um, Russia under Peter the Great established 12 as the age of access to military service. Uh, that was maintained through the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and again, although some militaries worked a little bit harder to call out uh, the youngest of the, of, the, of the group we would regard, regard as children, systematic control for age was simply not part of the military establishment. And finally, and probably most familiarly, work. Many work situations did allow for a category for childhood through some system, either formal or informal, of apprenticeship. But there were many situations, uh, often, for example, because of parental death, in which children uh, assumed or were forced to assume clearly adult work roles uh, and there were no legal barriers to this. So we begin with a baseline in which childhood in a number of major aspects was not clearly defined after a period of early childhood. Um, and in which again, for a variety of reasons, all sorts of creatures that we would regard as children found themselves in situations that were indistinguishable from those of adults. This situation began to change, as I've already indicated, in the later 18th century. And I think it began to change for two reasons, although these, these bear discussion. Uh, reason number one and the most familiar is by the later 18th, early 19th centuries, Western societies were, were beginning to move into a period of rapid social and economic change, which would ultimate, ultimately be part of the Industrial Revolution. And these changes put young people in situations where it simply had to be recognized that um, traditional standards might need to be rethought. Um, this is most obviously familiar in the case of work. Child labor began to be recognized as a problem uh, once factory uh, situations began to arise. But the second component, and this pushes it back a bit chron chronologically, the second component of redefinition was the emergence of a new idea of childhood emanating from the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. John Locke's famous dictum that the child was a tabula rasa, a blank slate, is obviously and correctly most, most commonly interpreted as, a, as an invitation to pay more attention to the education of the child, to the improvability of the child, and in, in many respects, that was its most important historical role. But it has a flip side, uh, because by the same, uh, by the same argument, um, if children were born a blank slate, there was a prolonged, if not clearly defined period of childhood when they were not really capable of, of, of full functioning. And I think this, this notion of childhood as a separate, less developed stage of life 
fed into the redefinition along with the more familiar social and economic changes. Okay, so where does this show up? Um, marriage was one of the first topics to be raised and I think it's really worthwhile asking and I'm not pretending fully to answer here why that was so. In 1753, for example, uh, British legislation began to require adult consent, parental consent for marriages under 21. Uh, that was a really striking innovation. Um, the Napoleonic Code, the, the French Revolution did some work on this and the Napoleonic Code established a minimum age of marriage at 15 for girls, 18 for boys. The gender distinction here was actually a fairly familiar one and it would long persist. Uh, obviously, these were, these were initial straws in the wind. Uh, other Western societies moved into a definition of later marriage age um, at, at a somewhat uh, later date, but the tendency was quite clear. Somewhat later and much less consistently, attention also began, began to be paid to age of consent. Uh, the British, for example, raised, raised age, age of consent in terms of definition of, of sexual predation, uh, raised age of consent to the age of 13 in 1825. It would be moved up to 16 by legislation in the 1920s. American states moved toward a later definition of um, age of consent, mainly in the late 19th, early 20th century. The state of Delaware, as late as, late as 1880, had seven as the age of consent. But by 1920, the majority of American states had moved toward the age of 16 as the age of sexual consent. And this obviously would, would move up a, a little bit up later on. Anyway, uh, marriage and sexuality were areas of clear, if very gradual, um, implementation for a new conception of the separation between childhood and adulthood and a delay in the age at which that happened. Military service was a second early target. Uh, the British had moved the minimum age for military service up to 17. By the early 19th century, it would move up to 18 uh, by the early 20th. The American government, uh, in one of its actually earliest federal acts, that had any implications for children. In the law of 1802 uh, established that um, you had to be five foot six inches tall and 18 years of age to serve in the military. This turned out to be a somewhat porous definition. During the American Civil War, after the first couple of years, for example, uh, the federal government ruled that while 18 was the age of official permission to serve in the military, the military shouldn't bother kicking out anybody who was at least 16. So again, uh, a clear direction of change, a certain amount of flexibility in its implementation. The fourth category, I'm sorry, the third and fourth categories in which you see this movement toward a more formal definition of the boundary between childhood and adulthood and um, an escalation of the age at which this occurred uh, obvious is, is the most familiar of my categories. And this involves um, education and work. Um, governments beginning with Prussia in the 18th century began to stake out the notion that there should, should be a certain period of life devoted at least in part to education. They didn't initially stipulate the age. Prussian legislation, for example, under Frederick the Great uh, argued that uh, there should be an eight year period of education, didn't exactly say when, but by the early 19th century in association with the more familiar emergence of child labor laws, um, governments began to stipulate an educational period of life, either entirely devoted or at least partly devoted to education and therefore separate from later stages of life, usually ranging from about six to 12. And this was confirmed by the increasing interest in, um, let, uh, in regulating child labor. Um, various legislation in the 1830s and 40s tended to establish first that work in factories should not begin at all until age eight. Then there was a stage of age eight to age 12 in which work should be uh, limited, usually to eight hours. Um, some restriction might also apply after age 12, but it was really only later in the 19th century that the, uh, the work adulthood gap began to move up into the teenage years. Obviously, both work and education were categories in which legal definitions 
would continue to change in the later 19th and 20th centuries with the ages progressively moved up, if not 18, at least uh, to 16. Again, a basic change uh, in this case, early in the 19th century, progressively extended and more fully implemented. Uh, initial child labor laws applied only to factories and it would only be later, for example, in the United States, only in the 1920s, that this kind of legislation would be um, extended to all situations of work. And the final main case, and again, a fairly familiar one, but needs to be brought into this category, the uh, final major case in which this kind of uh, new legal approach began to apply to childhood, uh, apply to the um, treatment of criminals. Um, in 1847, the British, the British legislated um, uh, the need to pay attention to the age of the, uh, of, of the convicted person with the notion that young offenders should be treated somewhat differently from their adult counterparts. This was a somewhat tentative first move. Famously in 1899, uh, Cook County in the United States in Illinois uh, established the first juvenile court. And by this point and into the 20th century, the notion of separating juvenile from adult offenders, both in their um, definition of crime and, 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 and the, the tri tribunal through, uh, in which they should appear and in their subsequent punishment, this notion became increasingly common and increasingly extended. And the process would continue into the 20th century with new legislation uh, trying to restrict uh, children's access, public access to alcohol. Not too much attention was paid to that in the 19th century. Uh, later on, the advent of driver's license, et cetera. But the main point is entirely clear. Um, a long transition period, late 18th to early 20th, saw most Western societies in a variety of categories, marriage, sexuality, military service, work, education, uh, criminality, other activities, saw a variety of Western societies move into this pattern where increasingly formal definitions of the distinction between the child and the adult and a tendency to move the age of the transition up steadily was the basic process. The only major category in which a reverse trend applied, although here mainly in the 20th century, was somewhat interestingly voting, where voting rights, uh, the age of voting rights tended to move down. It may be amusing to remember that when the British first granted the vote to women, uh, for several years, uh, you had to be 30 to vote as a woman. It was only in 1928 that the age was reduced to 21. But in the main categories in which institutional intervention was involved, the increasing separation and the prolongation of age were the main trends. Okay, just in concluding, this was a profound change. I think it took so long because it required so much redefinition of previous assumptions of what children were for and how they were be, how they were to be treated and how they should be defined in relation to adults. Uh, the change took time. It was and remains uneven, even in Western society. And I think one of the most obvious uh, results of this kind of historical consideration is a is attention to the uh, to the assumptions that need to shift to create the conventional modern definition of the child, which is very very recent. Um, and the, the understandability of variation and resistance to this process. The one other thing I would add as a historian is any kind of change that's this fundamental and this sweeping, while most of us, including me, would obviously primarily focus on um, the issue of the desirability of the trend, concern about its continued uh, gaps and inconsistencies. In a historical process of this sort, it's also always to worth, worthwhile, at least briefly thinking about the flip side. What perhaps has been lost in this transition? A less familiar topic and a difficult one, but maybe one that would be interesting to discuss as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation. Thank you so much, um, Professor Stern. Um, and I think it really is really interesting to hear about that very long overarching global shift that as you put it is never quite put together 
Um, and I think it leads quite well into Professor Fleer's work, which looks a lot at that kind of global and local dynamic of things that happen overarchingly, but maybe work out a little bit differently at a local level. So our third speaker is Professor Marlon Fleer, um, who is a Foundation Chair in Early Childhood Education and Development at Monash University in Australia. Um, in particular, her recent work has looked at play and the very timely topic of digital play, um, which we're all very familiar with now. Um, welcome, Professor Fleer, um, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll just do a share screen and just check that you can all see that. Oops, I'm on the wrong slide, just a moment. Beautiful. Um, thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak to you. What, what is very early in the morning in Australia, <laughs> incredibly early. So I'd, I'll extend a, a good morning to all those people who are up early, um, a good afternoon and a good evening to um, at this global event. Um, this is such an important topic and I feel very honoured to have been asked to speak um, at uh, this event. And, uh, and be part of the, um, the series that you have. Um, so looking at the, the topic and the wonderful um, blurb that was sent out that for the three of us to address around what is a child, um, and um, Manoli um, asked me to, to speak specifically around um, these windows, the windows that provide um, a construction of childhood and um, from this particular book. And so I thought I'd begin there, but then move on to the more recent work that I've been involved in to take it one step further. So if we begin with this contesting of periodization as, um, um, as, as the, the fundamental aspect of what I'm going to be talking about, then um, as, as Peter has rightly said, there've been many, and I'm just going to just adjust my screen so I can see better. Um, there've been many constructions of, um, of what it means um, historically to be a child. Um, and it was, uh, Peter gave a, a really rich set of examples about the implications of that too, in terms of the kind of laws that play out further on, depending on how we construct childhood. And for me, I think what's been significant in the early childhood literature, which is the, the work that I'm primarily um, oriented towards, is this reification and the othering and perceiving of the child as innocent historically um, for a whole range of reasons, as Peter um, identified as, as we saw this transition and, and what is essentially a worldwide transition um, in Western um, democracy, shall we say, and this notion of the child being dependent and therefore um, vulnerable, um, and furthermore, also the construction of the child as cute. So there's many um, publications that have spoke to that. But then there's also this other window into, um, so we have this, this, first of all, historical construction, but there's also more um, and increasingly so, so a, a corporate construction of childhood. Um, because, you know, children and families are big business. And so, so markets um, and thinking about how you um, prepare toys for children, so classic case of and gaming and various other things, classic cases is, is of course, seeing on packaging, this is suitable, not suitable for a, for a child under three or not suitable for um, a child... Um, of a certain age. So this notion of the chrono chronological age or the biology of the child has been quite significantly stamped into these corporate constructions. And, um, and also, um, particularly in West Western contexts, but what we're also seeing is, um, uh, and many people have written about this too, is that kind of McDonaldization of, um, and the globalizing, um, colonizing that that has. And you know, most, most people are familiar with um, how particular um, uh, children are targeted. Um, so with um, particular toys in, um, as we might see, um, in, um, in the kind of food that's provided in the takeaways 
and therefore the nagging effect that is generated through this, the wanting of the toy, and therefore the so so corporatization of childhood has also become um, something that uh, has emerged. And similarly, um, we see connected to this, of course, is the popular culture. And, um, and this, this, this is quite interesting because it's almost um, as though, as Peter was saying about these transition movements, um, the popular culture has over time also created the impetus for, for transition. And um, we, we see that particularly, um, particularly in relation to um, dividing childhood, childhood up even further so that you have the sort of pre-teens area and the kind of things that children of, of that particular biological age might be interested in. But then there's also other parts of the kinder culture, but there's also other parts of what we see in the literature around this sort of hybridity um, when we look globally. And, um, and there's many examples um, in, in the kind of work that we see on television, through YouTube, um, TikTok, various other ty types of ways in which um, um, the social media has more recently impacted um, that we see this hybridity of cultures emerging. So it begins to then create a different kind of um, image of the child and therefore childhood. But there still is, of course, that, um, um, unpro you know, the problematic um, um, and therefore the Disney effect um, representation of different groups of peoples around the world. Um, in the kind of media that's presented and this kind of global subconscious uh, form of colonizing that therefore takes place that childhood has to look in a particular way um, and um, of course mass media feeds into that and you know big corporations um, have a significant um, a role in that process so and taking this further, then we start to look at the political constructions of childhood. And we know um, that different points in history, um, that there have been some very um, significant political changes in different countries, as we see here with Thatcher's children, where um, introduced into education systems where um, which house um, lots of children around the world, the different education systems, that when these become like businesses and children become positioned, children and parents become positioned as consumers or and therefore you have to introduce market forces, children become um, very much subjects of that system. So that's a particular construction as well. Um, and then there's the, related to that is the institutional constructions where um, uh, we, we start to look at how in the institution of the educational system that's around the world, that we really do lock in that notion of the biology of the child. So all um, different to how children live in communities, education systems really do divide the children up into um, biology, into particular age cohorts. Um, so we have same age um, children in classrooms primarily, um, less, less so for multi-age groups, but still then within categories. And then this sets up particular kinds of expectations that, um, um, that are very problematic. So, so in bringing that first part of what I presented forward, this, there is this notion that if we start to look at all these different windows globally, and locally, we can start to say, well, let's look beyond a single conception of what is the child and also look beyond the single pathways of uh, children's development. And so the notion of the universal child in the education system, in the community, that there is only one pathway. And, and we start to think about also um, uh, the notion of going beyond a view of the child at a single point in time. And of course, um, uh, we saw that how that would plays out so beautifully in the work of Shan, um, illustrated to us with with the bio uh, archaeology, which I think is just a beautiful area to really tease out um, this this notion of childhood um, and thinking about childhood is not static and how this changes over time. 
So, but like Peter and Sean, there are implications to how when we construct childhood and a child in a particular way. So I just want to give a couple of um, small examples of this um, to illustrate this point. And if we think about what is the child and therefore what is child's development, um, we can look at um, we can look at the kind of work that um, was done um, some time ago, and I've, I've got the reference down here, um, where the growth charts um, for children um, was adopted and stayed adopted by the World Health Organization for a very long period of time and as a universal view of how all children grow and develop. So we're just talking about biology here. And of course, we go much broader than that. But it's a really rich example of how um, in one cultural community, and this, this was particularly, uh, this was developed in the US in Ohio, um, the scales where they they um, measured um, infants and growth and developed, of course, universal um, milestones around what would be expected. But interestingly, after having it um, available in the community as the measurement tool for what would be expected of children's um, early growth um, in infancy, um, they learned later that, of course, through studying well, a bit more of the um, institutional localised context, that these babies were not breastfed, but were bottle fed. And, and notoriously, of course, bottle fed babies are much heavier. So, um, so the, the point of this example is to illustrate is to illustrate how these kind of constructions of the child and what would be expected of the child and the kinds of milestones are all tied up with with the view of what is a child. So, if they're viewed as as um, incomplete adults, or they're viewed as cute. Um, or they're viewed in a particular way, then this determines all of the kinds of things that surround the child, what's expected of the child, expected of the child's development, and therefore the conditions we, we, um, we create. So if we're thinking about taking this a little further, this is where I, I like to link it to my own work. Um, so the theoretical tradition that I um, work in is cultural historical um, theory. And, um, and this, this gives more of a perspective for, for thinking about um, the, uh, the idea of um, um, taking on board the historical, taking on board the societal um, uh, level, taking on the institutional level and the personal level, and all of those dynamics in the construction of what might be considered childhood. And I want to give the example um, to illustrate the, this. And, and of course, it's quite fitting that I'm the final speaker because um, this links very much to both presenters' work uh, in a different kind of way. And so I feel adds, adds some value to our discussions today, tonight, uh, this morning. And, um, and that is drawing on the work of Elkonen, who's from the uh, Russian context. I want to just give this as a historical example around um, children and childhood. And in the work that he did, he was very, he explored um, anthropological research. He looked at, um, looked at archaeological digs to see what artefacts were left in graves in relation to children. So he did a lot of museum research, shall we say. Um, in order to start to think about um, what 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 kind of childhoods existed and and the and the place of play within that, and the argument he makes, um, whether you believe his um, argument or not, is is irrelevant. But it's an interesting um, argument that I want to put forward. Is that he talked about the idea of, and I'll give some of the examples he illustrated, is that. Um, Historically, when children were part of a family, extended family unit in, and were involved in, their, in food production, they had a very active role in the community. And people like Barbara Rogoff have also spoken about this in, in uh, contemporary times across cultures, suggesting this is also the case. So that they had a, had a real purpose within the community and there was no categorization of work and play as we might see in Western um, communities. So children were had 
a role. So the example he gives of, is of the child out with the family. Um, we're using a digging stick to dig a hole. So the strongest person in the family digs the hole with the digging stick and the child who's least likely to have the strength of the adult will place the seed into the ground. And so we'll have a, a purpose um, as part of that. But as technology changed and developed um, and um, it, plows were invented for the food production processes and more strength was needed, children um, took less, less of a role in the processes of what was expected of the community work for food production. And over time, of course, as the technologies and tractors developed, the argument was, he suggested, that this concept of childhood started to be developed. And, and he, gives, he gives examples of scaled down toys as an illustration. So looking at spinning tops, um, being introduced to children. So that pushing action was very similar to being able to, um, um, and to, to do this kind of action with the spinning tops. All of those things were very important toys to support children to develop the skills of fire lighting, for instance, he argues. So toys started to act as substitutes um, for the real work um, in order to build the skill set required. Um, similarly, string games, he argues, occurred in, um, began in fishing communities and, um, and the string games were all designed to support children over that period of childhood to grow, um, to develop the capabilities that needed for mending and preparing fishing um, for the fishing industry that kept the survival of the community going. So these, and his argument is therefore the complexity of tools and work meant that childhood was lengthened as more technologies evolved over time. Um, uh, and the um, concept of toys and time devoted to this um, became embedded in communities. So this is the argument he makes. So if we took that as just as an illustration, then we can start to say, well, when we begin to think about the local and global constructions of what is the child, then there isn't, we think about these windows, there hasn't been a universal view. There's no permanent view. Um, there, we may have a definition, but historically, this definition has always been in transition, um, as um, Peter rightly argued. And there have been huge gaps, as um, Sean has also suggested too, with mother and infant um, mortality um, and, and not being um, visible in the archaeological um, evidence, uh, well, certainly visible, visible physically, but not necessarily um, scholarly. And so the need for changing it. So this conceptualising childhood is diverse sociocultural tracks through different institutions across time, cultures, communities, and countries is really quite significant. And what I wanna do is, is just illustrate um, what I believe is very important for us to take forward um, in this viewing of the concept of what is a child um, and this, this notion of contesting the idea of biological determined age groups. Um, and that is, because um, um, what comes with that, in my view, is a narrow narrowing of expectations of children. And so this little video clip, which is, which is just over a, a minute um, um, that I want to share with you, is, is, is this idea, um, it's an example from work that I've been doing with young children um, and, and teachers in early childhood settings. And the children have been part of a very rich cultural experience. And in this case, this particular example is where the children have been um, experiencing through role play and over time, the, uh, the, the world of Robin Hood and the um, inequities uh, associated with robbing uh, from, um, from the poor to the rich, and then the notion of Robin Hood uh, redistributing the wealth. And the children uh, in this example have designed what they, um, to solve this problem, to redistribute the wealth back to the villagers, uh, what they've called a grabby hand machine. So this is a collective 
um, construction, which the children um, talk about. And we have examples of the children using iPads to bring the, like a QR code, bring these um, examples to life. And this is one of the examples from the QR code. Um, so the, this, this child's um, view and explanation and why I'm sharing it with you is that I want you to hear the, the richness of the language and the, um, the beyond this narrow expectation of children. Um, when, when, we start to, uh, when, when we start to box children into what we expect of them at particular developmental periods based on a particular view of what children are capable of or not capable of, and usually it's not capable of, this does problematize this. And so this child um, illustrates her understanding of the machine that they have designed and created. So let's have a listen and then I'll finish. Yeah. Okay, so. so, um, the boom, um, makes the same state, and there's another boom, and there's lots of booms, but... Why did we need a boom on the grubby hand? Because it was... Hold the pulley up and hold the next pulley up and hold the next pulley up and it will lift the golden treasure up and the dragon. Can you tell us about the grabby hand mechanism? The grabby hand mechanism is just like a little crane. Like this. Which physical machines did we need to make our complex machine? Um, I'll, I'll just stop it there, but it gives yeah. you the illustration of um, the um, the um, the complexity of what she's working working with here, there, the teacher and the child. So when when we start to think out what is a child with it, conceptualizing it constantly in, in motion in the process of development and never universal. And I feel that um, whilst it's important to legislate and to have biological constructions at times, it's also, it is only one part of this broader puzzle when we're looking at the societal values, the valuing of the child, um, the valuing of the educational program that surrounds the child, the institutional practices that, um, that open up rather than shut down what a child may be able to do in the educational system, and that we should always stay open and surprised um, for this. And so I'll conclude there with that thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Flair. And that was really, really fascinating, especially to see um, just that kind of richness of vocabulary and concept grasping that is something we don't often pay attention to in childhood. I guess the first thing I'd like to do um, before I open up, we're already getting questions in. The first thing I'd like to do is um, with Sean and Peter, sort of Marla mentioned that, you know, what we're seeing or what we can see is sometimes a narrowing childhood being a narrowing of expectations of what some people in the world can do. I was wondering what, what your response is to that, what you think about that. I was, I was just um, thinking about that from a cross-cultural perspective in terms of what Marilyn was talking about with the construction of age cohorts in, in education. Um, in, in New Zealand um, Māori society, we've got a construction of what's called tua kana, um, dash tainer, which is really a it's integral to Maori society. It's kind of a buddy system um, where you've got an older brother, sister, cousin looking after a little one and teaching them. So um, in many ways, you know, in education or you know, out of education. So I think we do need to think about challenging some of these constructions just based on biology and especially thinking about what's uh, culturally appropriate in, in different circumstances. Sure, well, again, um, I, I think the tension that Marilyn established is, is absolutely crucial and I would simply echo it. I think our, our presentations actually point in very much the same direction. But I would simply echo it by saying, when, when, when I looked at the, uh, the extent to which um, the, the gap between childhood and adulthood was ill-defined 
before the later 18th century. I think the normal official reaction and up to a point entirely appropriate was, my gosh, how could that have existed? Think of the exploitation involved. Think of the opportunities to mistreat children, but flip it. Because obviously the same, the same di distinction means that many people whom we regard as children were doing all sorts of interesting and, construct and constructive things that we tend to impede with our current definitions. This is simply a tension. I think it's a, a, an unavoidable tension in trying to figure out the relationship between children as needing special protections and children as capable of all sorts of interesting activities. Yeah, I was, it made me think there's a work by um, Tatek Abebe where he talks about societal interdependence being more useful than thinking of one group as dependent on another. But I guess it, I was wondering if some of the issue here is not to do with childhood at all, but our definition of adulthood as this agentic period of self-determination. Because right. I'm thinking, Marilyn, when you were talking about play, like, don't adults play? I mean, Catherine Gleedle's written articles on adults playing at soldiers, just like children play at soldiers, like volunteer regiments, and it's nothing different. And I don't know if kind of categorizing this particular ludic behavior as peculiar to children um, is kind of missing the mark of something that we all do. I think that's really interesting, Catherine, because um, when, when you look at the play literature across cultures, um, there are some cultures um, where, where play is, is, is not seen as a valued activity in that community. So we have to, to look at it from a cultural perspective as well. And um, But there's also Western constructions of what is play and therefore there's a lot of literature uh, in different cultural contexts um, that totally totally misses um, the the interesting play that's actually going on because they because Western societies haven't created a construct to label it yet, <laughs> and um, um, and so I say that disparagingly of, of you know my own context as well and um, and so I think when when you start to open up well what what do we mean by play um and we start to think about well is play then the preserve of the child i totally agree with you catherine i i think this is it's 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 something that looks different in different cultures and in different you know age groups whether they're adults or children if we want to use that trajectory um it's and it serves a different purpose so um but then they're so it complicates it even further, in my view, um, in a good way. So I agree with Peter about the tension here. Um, there is this this tension. So maybe maybe you're right. Maybe maybe if we were to have debates about well, what do we mean by adulthood as opposed to what do we mean by a child, we might have a, a different kind of um, answer. Okay, we've got so many questions coming in. I think I will kick it off. Um, so the first question, um, Stephen asks, given that the definition of the boundary between childhood and adulthood differs between cultures um, and varies according to educational, education and life expectancy, um, is it not sufficient to allow the UN to negotiate a universally applied age and review it periodically? So having a kind of imperfect system, but then having a system of sovereign states kind of makes, it, makes nothing else possible. Like it's the only possibility we have. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Well, I think it's an excellent question. And I guess I'm inclined to agree that at least in the current situation, a um, what really is essentially an artificial agreement on an age is a desirable step, step toward a greater protection for children against exploitation. But I also think we need within societies to discuss some of the um, some of the complexities and disadvantages of that kind of, of, of uh, singular demarcation. But this is not, at least from my standpoint, this is not an objection to the UN standard as probably the best thing we can do for right now. Uh, uh, oh, Catherine, you go ahead. I was just about to ask, it, kind of in the frame of being global and local, Marilyn, if maybe you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, I, I was just going to respond to that and say that actually this um, dynamic tension between global and local um, 
what is really important. And, and we know that um, theoretically tension um, can create really nice possibilities um, for new thought and new ideas. And so having this local um, and global perspective on, on childhood um, enshrined in the UN or in any um, context, I think would be a, a really productive way forward because it then it then gives it then what it creates is a dialogue in that country or in that community around what what do we mean here is this is this exploitation for us in this setting or are we actually limiting what children can do here right. yeah. because we we've, we've, we've put a um, a lid on what we expect so so having a having a definition that creates a dynamic tension i think can be really very enabling but because we are so global i mean Look at how currently the you know the um, different countries are um, discussing potential conflicts, uh, shall we say? Um, if if there were countries where there uh, as, as there uh, where where people were the UN was worried, then that opens up an international dialogue as well. So so you then have that kind of broader public global discussion around this tension and and that can that i think can be very productive for uh for for us globally as and and individually in different countries because we can look to other countries who are having this debate and say well why aren't we having this debate um and what do we mean by this and so that then can be a very agentic process for a country to go down and one would hope there's enough safeguards in the kind of un definition of childhood that where you had this global and local tension in the definition that it would allow the protection that you're talking about Peter um, but also the enabling um, processes for taking taking the um, what is possible in a country through through children's experience forward. I have a question for Sean from Minoli um, uh, she asks about your mention could I could I just oh, sorry. sorry no no could I could I just um make some observations um in particular about the the dialogue that um Marilyn just talked about I think it is really important to have the local contextualized culturally contextualized um definitions I do wonder where and you'll be able to tell me where this 18 year old definition came from what what the, what the basis of that is um, I do think it's obviously very important in terms of protection um, but I if I if you think about it from a biological perspective there's still a lot of development that's happening and lots of brain development that's happening for example and I a great example that's always used at our university is you know the students who come come through you know oh well you know they're still you know developing this and you know so 21 year olds may, may still be treated um with some childhood status um yeah I just I just want yeah I just had those kind of uh questions really about where this historically where this 18 year old definition came from and if anyone knew is there, is there something within England for example that there's an 18 year old cut off I think maybe well it's there. it's most commonly agreed upon now as the standard voting age although there there's some disputes about that I mean yeah. this was this was really the I, in some sense, the, the, the culmination the driving in, the, for in the mid to late 20th century yeah. of the kind of developments I was talking about uh, that had yeah. pushed toward 12 and then 13 and then 16 as school leaving age, et cetera. So it was simply a further extension of that. Yeah, because it's interesting because in terms of, um, you know, getting getting married, for example, you know, 16 year olds can get married, you know, with permission and stuff like that. So it's you know, it's, it's interesting to think about. It's also interesting because like 19th century societies, it was very class based. I mean, people not, yeah. might, class people might not get married till 24, 25. Yeah. Only referred to as a girl or a boy up until that stage. 
um, and still be, be seen as quite youthful because they were living at home and they had dependent status and they didn't have their own household. And that would obviously vary according to class, but it's, it's a, that created a much longer transition period for some young people versus others. Um, Sean, there was another question about, and it actually links exactly to this, because you mentioned um, puberty and the point at which childhood ended and reproductive phase began. Could you speak a bit more about that? Yeah, there's been really interesting work done by Mary Lewis at the University of Reading and her colleagues looking at skeletal indicators of things like peak height velocity and estimations of menarche and that kind of thing and how different um, nutritional and infection environments can actually change that. Um, so whereby, you know, at the moment in some societies, you've got girls going through puberty getting their periods quite early. Um, whereas in some of the studies that they've done in um, medieval times, um, they've shown that it, it's quite a lot later. So that would actually have a bearing on their ability to, to have children and whether or not that um, would change the definition of what <laughs> people would consider, you know, the, the child adolescence um, and the boundary and into adulthood is another thing, but it's something that really needs to be investigated more. It would certainly um, cause issues um, in terms of the, these girls who are, you know, maybe have growth retardation, growth stunting and that type of thing and, and bearing children. Um, so I think it's always really important to keep in mind, you know, thinking about childhood, it's not really, just the age of course but it's it's the treatment and the care and the resources that, that children have for their best development one of the features of the pattern that developed in the 19th century in the west was the age of puberty was going down whereas efforts mm -hmm. to define childhood were going up so puberty became less attached to definitions of childhood and adulthood than had been the case previously yeah, it's interesting that conception of um, fertility yeah. versus um, uh, age of menarche, for example. And Barry Bogan, who's an evolutionary biologist, anthropologist, has, has looked a little bit at that. And while, you know, girls can go through puberty quite early, they're not, you know, they actually often have years of um, cycles where they're not actually releasing an egg, for example. Um, and although in Western society, they may be seen as being fertile, you know, they've got breast development, they look, you know, potentially quite able to bear a child, but they're not necessarily um, able to. And he argues that this is an, you know, a social, cultural, evolutionary mechanism where they're seen as um, being able to do this and they're kind of enculturated to, to um, learn about, you know, social, sexual, roles in society and childcare and that kind of thing. Um, taking his arguments with a little bit of a grain of salt because they're kind of quite Western in terms of gender dynamics. Right. Thank you. Um, so Naya has a question. What is the impact on children's rights if childhood is understood as a sociological construct? I mean, it's interesting, like what we're all problematizing childhood. What's the end of that? What happens? Um, this is open to everyone. So I, I, I'm not sure if I understand this question totally. Are they saying that there, so there's no actual definition and it can be constructed in terms of um, local ideas of so childhood. I suppose if we think of childhood as a kind of social category what does that mean for children's rights I think this is the whole point I mean childhood is both a social I would argue in a biological construct um, and they they intersect um, yeah I, I agree with what you're saying there too Shana's um, an example of, of that would be this intersection um, 
is um, an example. It would is if we think about an infant. So an infant has to be carried, but the um, but the moment the infant can walk, it has access to so many things. So it has more agency. I mean, obviously, an infant has a lot of agency because it can use its crying voice um, to communicate. But um, if the context is not responsive to the infant, so therefore the social and cultural context not responsive, then the communication of the infant is difficult. Um, but if the infant can walk, um, then, you know, they, um, as they become toddlers, then they can access what they want and need and put themselves in danger as well, of course. Um, and this is, this is the kind of, in, so as a child, so the intersection then becomes as the child can access the thing that might be the food, or it might be exploration, looking at the flower, um, so it can be fed cognitively as well. Um, then the child, then the child, the child's um, able to do more things and therefore develop more. And so you have this very symbiotic relationship between biology and the cultural context in which the child is in. And um, so I think that adds to the, the dynamics of the construct, social construction of, of childhood as we are talking about it. So I just, I just feed that in as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a question I really, really enjoy. How do children conceptualize childhood themselves and what value would be created by us actually engaging with this seriously? As someone who works exclusively on children's writing, this is a great thing to discuss. I think it's an amazing question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd be interested, does anyone have some research on it? I, I haven't read anything on this in this space in terms of children's constructions themselves of childhood. I've heard many things about, you know, children's perspectives, um, but not necessarily in relation to how they conceptualise childhood. Does anyone on the panel or elsewhere know? I think it's an excellent question. I don't have a definitive response, but I do think probably the increasing emphasis on age grading and the increasing uh, emphasis on childhood as a period of non-adulthood and dependency makes older children increasingly anxious to make it clear that they're no longer children. And I would, I, I, th there, there was an aspect of the, of the emergence of the concept of adolescence in the 19th century that did this as well. So I have scattered evidence from the 1930s, for example, that high school students in the United States were really eager to make it clear that they weren't children, even though legally they were increase, increasingly regarded as such. So my guess is the desirability of making it clear that you're not a child uh, for groups that we would regard as older children probably increased with the kinds of changes we've been talking about today. Um, my child's just woken up. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really interesting thinking about children um, studying childhood. Um, there has been some work um, that's been done on uh, archaeological interpretations of sites um, where there may be huts or remnants of structures and that type of thing and how they actually interpret those. And they've actually been used for some publications and that type of thing because things that were previously overlooked um, in terms of you know, the archaeological context uh, were probably likely made by, by children in the past, whereas they've been interpreted in a totally different way by some adults. So it's really important even for the scholarly process in looking at childhood in the past, is to have their, their input. Yeah, if anyone's looking for, I mean, all my recommendations would be 19th century and later in Britain, but I really like Karen Sanchez Epler's book, Dependent States, which looks mm -hmm. at how children constructed childhood through writing. Um, and Sean Pooley's work on children's writing and working class children's writing in Britain and how they constructed childhood. Um, and also Catherine Giedel's work on the juvenile enlightenment and how, child, how as that new shift in category of childhood came out, how children really actively implicated in creating that. Uh, and finally, Laura Tisdall's work, um, who did a really great recent study of how mid 20th century teenagers defined adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, 
and what that tells us about childhood, because obviously teenagers are talking about adulthood all the time. So there is, especially in 19th century Britain, but I'd be really interested if people have recommendations outside of my kind of zone. Okay, Catherine, can I ask a question about that? Because I'm, I'm interested to know um, how each of the authors created the context in which the conversation could be had. So did they create scenarios or did they just, you know, how, how did they do it and what kind of age groups? Because I work with infants, toddlers and preschoolers mm. primarily. So you have to create, if you want to get um, children's perspectives on something, you have to create very interesting scenarios. And one quick example before I, you respond, while well, you have time to think then, is um, I had a I had some contract research um, some time back, which was for the city of Melbourne, where they wanted to, uh, they wanted the children's perspective on, um, you know, healthy living and healthy cities. And so for the different age groups, we created different kinds of role plays um, where they, you know, we went with cameras out like a news team and interviewed um, people in the street for the slightly older children and the younger children, they they went out with wishing stones and put them where they wished something would be different. So different kind of scenarios in order to give an authentic voice so that it was respectful of, of the kind of, you know, level of engagement that you would want to have with them. So curious, so that's just an example of what I mean. And I ask, how did, the, how did they get at the notion of construction of childhood? Because it is very complex. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's bound up with literacy. So all of these are literate children, mm. right, um, to varying extents. Um, and so their letters, their diaries, and um, also the Mass Observation Project in 1930s Britain collected a lot of materials from school children, which was set as right. a part of their schoolwork. But I guess one of the interesting things is when we're thinking about sort of authenticity, um, is the fact that, you know, everything as historians we touch is constructed in some way by someone for some purpose. And it's always very interesting to see children engage with the constructedness of writing um, and manipulating the kind of codes that are implicit in when we write a diary or when we write um, a poem, for example. Um, and that is obviously another part of their, their social and cultural world. Um, so just as a final question, because we're coming up for time. Oh, just as another thing, Marilyn, there's a, the, a researcher at, um, at Goldsmiths, Melissa Nolas, and she commented to me that when they do research with children, a lot of her PhDs get children to draw until she realized children hate it because they're like, oh, they always make us draw because we're children, <laughs> make us draw our experience. And that was a really interesting one of children being aware that there are discourses of childhood and what children like that they're being pushed into in the actual research process, which mm. is really fascinating. Yeah, really, it really is. Yeah. Um, so we do have loads of other questions, so I am going to have to really choose. Um, so Philip asks, how can we stay open and be surprised in a real context in Britain today? The education system are has very high, is very highly performative and has very normative concepts of development. Um, and they tend to be non-negotiables in terms of what children are expected to do in schools at each year. I was wondering, like, how, what do we do about things like this? <laughs> yeah, the giggle is appropriate. It's very, very tricky because it comes back to this, the political context in which the, which you're located and the, and the, um, as an outsider, so I'll just make a reflection from the outside and um, and, and um, as we're all outsiders to the UK, <laughs> except for you, uh, Catherine, um, as an outsider, I view this because uh, Australia often tries to copy what's happening in the UK politically in all sorts of fronts. And so we watch as an academic community, we watch very closely uh, at the things that aren't working, <laughs> and we report on them. Um, so that doesn't answer the question of what you do um, in the UK, but it's just to say that you're a t test case for things that can go wrong, <laughs> like, like all sorts of experiments, I guess. Um, but you're in a very political context, and I just feel, uh, I feel, I feel if we're talking about values and ethics, 
I feel that educators and teachers um, in the UK are so under undervalued, under resourced, and positioned in such a, a um, challenging way. Um, it's beyond it's beyond an individual to be able to make that kind of change because that's a an expectation change from the political because the politics is so interwoven into the curriculum process in the UK. Um, where non-experts are making comments uh, and directing things. I wonder if, I wonder if, um, and maybe this is not happening in the UK, but the COVID has created in Australia a very healthy respect for politicians standing up, premiers of states, for instance, and having a scientist standing with them to give advice to the community. And there is now a sea change where politicians are feeling very comfortable to call in experts and therefore make really informed decisions. And I think in the UK, what I see as an outsider is that um, that voice has been lost uh, in the UK in because not because the voice is not good or anything like that or strong, it's just there's no willingness to hear it. And, and, to, and we've just had a very nice sea change where there is this willingness to hear and so we are all moving fast to have a voice, a strong voice, um, to make sure that education and the expectations of curriculum, which of course is a stepped process where we can stay open, um, is, is guided by people who know <laughs> the area, who are experts in the area. So sorry, that's just an outsider's perspective, very personal. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to have to call it a day. Thank you so much for all the really interesting insights. I think we could have carried that discussion on for another half hour. We haven't even touched on colonialism, which is another thing people brought up. Um, oh, yeah. To all of our speakers, um, Sean, Peter and Marilyn, especially uh, given you're choosing such unusual times of the day. And um, thank you to Leon and our other organisers, Nika, Minoli and Wei Am for organising this and making it run so smoothly. Um, and thank you to everybody who asked questions. Thank you, everybody. I just want to add a, a final thank you. I, I particularly colleagues in Australia and New Zealand uh, dialing in at, I don't know if it's late or early, somewhere in between the two. Um, Xi'an, it is wonderful to see the sunlight behind you. I can't remember when I last saw the sun, but you've got wonderful light. Yeah, you know, it's, it's wonderful, yeah. Um, New Zealand's yeah. the best place in the world. <laughs> and thanks for the light that you have shed on this topic. It was it was a fascinating, rich and important discussion. I'm very grateful for your contributions. It has changed some of my thinking uh, and, and raised lots of questions. So huge thanks. Thanks to our audience for, for joining us today and uh, Catherine for chairing, to you all for speaking, uh, Joanne for organising. And a final word just to say that we'll be back in two weeks time uh, to go into the classroom, really building on that that last bit of the discussion, what, uh, looking at the child as a learner, um, although I, that has to be in the light of our broader understanding of childhood and the role of childhood in relation to adulthood, um, but looking at pedagogy and what happens in the classroom. Uh, so we'll be back in two weeks' time, um, and I hope colleagues will join us then. Huge thanks to everybody for joining and for wonderful talks. Um, that's where we must stop.